So hello everybody and welcome to the Institute of Re Refrigeration's uh, World Refrigeration Day celebration. We're just allowing everybody to drop into the meeting room as they join us today this afternoon. Uh, my name is Miriam Rodway. I'm the chief exec of the IOR and I'm going to be talking us through the program as we go through everything today. We've got quite a lot going on. We've got lots of uh, people who are involved closely in working at the Institute on careers events. We've also got a lot of students, young people and award winners who are going to share their experience and hopefully give you some inspiration to help doing some more work to promote in refrigeration careers. And anybody who's interested in joining the industry who might be part of the call as well, hopefully you'll get some good ideas there. So really, I think that we've got everybody in at the moment that we needed. So again, thank you very much for joining. And I'm going to hand straight over to our president, Mike Creamer, who's going to give you a welcome. Good afternoon and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for sparing the time to join us today for our Cool Careers event, uh, which I hope you'll find informative and enjoyable. Well, as your president, I would normally deliver an address at our annual dinner to an audience of several hundred all dressed in DJs and evening gowns, but uh, I'm sure you'll understand why that's not possible on this occasion, so maybe next year. So I'm instead speaking to you from my hotel bedroom in Manchester, where I'm working on the huge water chillers with Mark Forsyth, who will be speaking world skills later. Uh, I'm really excited about today's events, given their special importance to our industry. So moving on to our programme, if we may, in the next slide, you will see that we have a, a lot of interesting and relevant topics for you. These focusing on recruitment of the next generation of engineers and promoting careers within schools. Then we'll have three research students from UK universities, each delivering a three minute thesis on their research, one of whom will be voted the winner of the Ted Perry Award. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. They'll be uh, followed by three trainees and apprentices telling us why they decided on our industry for the future and uh, for their future. We'll also have an overview of world skills showcasing our UK engineering. And we also have two other awards today, these being the Award for Lifetime Achievement by a Service Engineer and the Ted Perry Student Research Prize. So moving on, what are cool careers? Well, the Institute clearly recognises the fact that we have critically important need for more skilled men and women in our industry sector. I've personally been very aware of this situation for the last 30 years. And that's why I've dedicated so much of my time and effort toward the training and certification of competent engineers. But the need is now greater than ever before. Young people about to leave school have many career choices available to them. And if we do not make them aware of the excellent career opportunities that we can offer and the variety that our air conditioning, refrigeration and heat pump sector has, we will lose them to other industries, perhaps indefinitely. Hence the tremendous efforts being made by the STEM program, STEM standing for science, technology, engineering, and maths, all of which are essential underpinning components to our technical sector. We'll be learning more about this very important activity from Jacinta Caden today, a STEM ambassador and a member of the IOR Education Committee. Moving on to the next slide, women in engineering today. We had the Women in Engineering Day yesterday with this theme being um, engineering heroes. In my long career, I've had the opportunity of working with many women engineers in electronic engineering, quality control and building services. Given the industry shortage of engineers across the wide range of essential skills and job roles, it's obvious that more women in our industry can help us to solve our skills shortage dilemma. I'd like to see more women involved in design, project management, product development, and manufacturing. I've seen women manufacturing critical electronic components and diligently uh, brazing heat exchanger coils, so they can pretty much do anything. I also remember, well, it was diligent women constructing our very complex Spitfire aircraft wings. And it was Catherine Johnson, a NASA mathematician, whose calculations of orbital mechanics were critical to the success of the early US space flights. And Dorothy Vaughan was the supervisor of West Area Computers, NACA in 1949, which then became NASA. So just think how much women might be doing for us and themselves in our vast industry. The question is, how do we find them? So let's do our best to recruit them. So moving on to the next slide, why do skills matter so much for our sector? 
In order to underpin our expanding industry, we must provide the essential education and training to our young engineers of the future, enabling them to carve out interesting, exciting and rewarding careers in air conditioning and refrigeration, whilst doing their best to protect our planet's environmental future. And we need as many of you young engineers as we can get if we are to deliver efficient cooling and refrigeration to the world. Humankind is highly reliant on cooling and refrigeration. So given we cannot do without it, let's make sure that all our systems are as technically advanced and as efficient as possible by developing highly skilled air conditioning and refrigeration engineers. It's estimated there are over 5 billion air conditioning and heat pump systems and 15 million people working in our industry across the world. Then add to that the colossal number of installed refrigeration systems. Accordingly, our industry requires well-trained, skilled and certified engineers. And we need thousands of you, both men and women. This is why technical training reinforced by practical skills is so important to our future. So some of you may ask, what are the career opportunities within our ACHP industry? Well, the job opportunities include design engineer, service engineer, field technician, R&D engineer, commissioning engineer, controls engineer, BMS engineer, software engineer, applications engineer, and sales engineer, and even more. So note the emphasis on engineer, and this is why we need engineering training so much. You may also eventually become a supervisor, managing uh, director or a director of your own company, and perhaps start your own business uh, in air conditioning and refrigeration, employing other people. So next slide for our IOR top priorities. From the start of my two year tenure, I've had a very clear institute objective in mind. And I'm delighted to tell you that out of eight possible objectives, the IOR members voted on four top priorities, all of which closely align with mine. You can see the top priorities listed here. Note that the great emphasis on education and training, the key that unlocks the door to great and exciting careers in our industry. Moving on to slide eight, what are our members doing to address this? Here you can see what we're doing to meet those priorities where we have several working groups working on apprenticeships, design engineers and operative training. We have networks for STEM ambassadors, young engineers, young members, I'm sorry, employers offering work experience and the engineering council. There are education guidance notes on working in schools, CPD, skills roadmaps and apprenticeships. And there's PR and publicity covering articles, news, profiles of students, competition winners, and the importance of training and our beyond refrigeration work. Moving on to our next slide. Here you see some of the uh, activities being undertaken by Institute members. Naturally, one must also build up experience in order to become fully capable and competent, especially given the wide array of engineering skills that one requires in air conditioning, refrigeration, and now heat pump technology. I've been a member of the Institute since 1984, and in those 37 years, this wonderful Institute has been a great asset to my career, with me accumulating most of the Institute's technical papers and data, many of which have proven so useful to me. It's my hope that you will also use the Institute to help you as you pass through your air conditioning and refrigeration career. And whilst I've added many strengths to my bow of activities, I'm still wholly dedicated to passing on the essential technical knowledge and practical skills to both experienced and new engineers entering our profession. 31 years on and we are still busy training and certifying engineers in all of these essential disciplines. And there's so much to enjoy and learn within this wonderful industry, including mechanics, thermodynamics, electrical engineering, psychometrics, fluid flow, refrigerants, compressors, heat exchangers, control devices, electronics, software engineering, air movement, air handling, ducting, pipework pumps, and much more. Indeed, as it's frankly impossible to learn it all and to know everything, you certainly won't be bored. And there are so many applications our industry um, has to serve, including food production and preservation, pharmaceuticals, warships, hotels, office buildings, cinemas, hospitals, laboratories, and even nuclear power stations. So you'll find yourself involved with so much variety, your career will always be interesting and enjoyable. If you like calculations, there's more than enough to learn. If you enjoy using your hands, there are many practical skills to choose from. Or like me, you may want to aim yourself at the critically important reduction of our energy consumption as we work towards the goal of net zero CO2 emissions for the well-being of our planet Earth. You may already know that more than 17% of global energy is consumed by cooling and refrigeration. 
We're also heading for a substantial increase in heat pump installations at the domestic level. Fortunately, heat pumps are three to four times more efficient than gas and oil fired boilers, and so we should see some substantial reduction in CO2 emissions and global warming. But this gives you some idea of the sheer size of our industry across the world. This is why one of the Institute's working groups, headed by Professor Graham Moment, has uh, worked so hard to set out every possible means of reducing energy consumption and the global warming impact of our RACHP systems, which is one of our four top priorities. Consequently, we're going to need a massive increase in the number of capable engineers to install, service and maintain our ever increasing base of installed equipment and systems. And we need more design engineers to develop products and to design energy efficient installations. Indeed, this is why another institute working group is developing an employer specification setting out the essential skills and requirements for design engineers. And I take this opportunity to give thanks for all the hard work and the input from all the members who've contributed so much to our working groups. Moving on to uh, World Refrigeration Day, I'm sure that uh, most of you are fully aware of the um, uh, uh, great thing and great work inaugurated by our past president, Steve Peel. This theme is cooling, uh, this year's theme is cooling champions, cool careers for a better world, and the IOR has been fully supportive of this great initiative and will continue to support it into the future, especially given the worldwide awareness that WRD is creating for our vital industry. Well, that's it from me for the time being, and I'd now like to hand you back to our excellent CEO, Miriam Bobway. Thank you. Thank you, Mike, and thank you for joining us from site. I mean, that is the uh, the exciting world of refrigeration where we never know where we're going to be from one to, one moment to the next. So uh, it's great that you're able to take the time just to run through that. And uh, sorry, we couldn't invite you to speak at the annual dinner this year. So coming back to our program, we have an awful lot of uh, different activities uh, uh, planned today, talking, uh, say, to students, prize winners and technicians. Uh, our first presentation is a recording. We've had a little bit of technical difficulty, so hopefully this will go okay. Uh, I'll ask Lisa to start this off with John Skelton, the chairman of our education committee and a personal journey through uh, skills promotion. Good afternoon. My name is John Skelton and I'm chair of the education and training committee. Unfortunately, I'm unable to join you in person this afternoon, but I'd like to thank the Institute for allowing me to record this short video. World Refrigeration Day has given us all a great platform to talk about our industry and it's given a wider audience an insight into the importance of the amazing things we do and a glimpse of the exciting and diverse careers available across our sector. I was keen to be involved today as I feel it's important that we all face into a challenge that will potentially affect our whole industry and could limit us from fulfilling our full potential. Anyone who has attended the Institute dinner over the last 10 years might be able to hazard a guess to what I'm referring to. It has to do with seeing the same group of predominantly white males every year in their best bib and tuckers. We have an ageing demographic, and yes, it's not lost on me that I'm one of those ageing white middle-aged men. Many of the faces we all know will, will be retiring in the coming years, and this is something that is being played out in businesses across our industry. None of us are getting any younger and the average age of our industry is certainly getting older. We have some amazing opportunities heading our way, but we need skilled individuals to grab those opportunities and run with them. We have an aging demographic and insufficient qualified individuals to take their places. Technology is changing at pace. The pressures on our businesses are immense, but it feels like training is no longer part of our DNA. However, training is more important now than it's ever been. So it's time we started dedicating the time and money to rebalance things if we want to stay ahead of the game. I, like many, sort of fell into the industry through a family friend, but I was lucky enough to serve a fantastic apprenticeship with Sainsbury's. At the time, apprenticeships were more commonplace, but for lots of reasons, that isn't the case today. I hadn't considered a career in engineering before that opportunity surfaced, and it certainly wasn't a career discussed at school. It won't surprise many of you that I wasn't the brightest individual at school and I frequently got in trouble. The reason I mention this is because I vividly remember my head of year telling me that if I didn't back up my ideas, I'd end up getting expelled and working as an engineer with oily hands. He made a real point about the oily hands. He actually said mechanic rather than engineer, 
but there is still a stigma around engineering in some circles and a misunderstanding about the amazing roles that are open to individuals, specifically for us in our industry. I must admit, I thought things had changed for the better, but a friend of mine in the industry told me a story relatively recently about a tour he'd organised for a local school to his manufacturing facility. He actually overheard one of the teachers tell a misbehaving student that if he didn't behave, he would end up working in a place like that. Now that's just downright rude, but it does emphasise the battle we're up against. It's tough to attract the right individuals at any age, so we need to be considering how we engage with school children, college students, graduates and our local communities as the competition from other sectors is fierce. Attracting the right individuals is also about understanding their needs and aspirations. Maybe the way we've done things in the past is, long, is no longer good enough and we need to consider some new approaches to recruitment, training and retaining good people. If we really want to capitalise on the opportunities that will come with the move to carbon net zero, FGAS and other changes in legislation, we need a workforce that's fit for purpose and to do that we need to change the perception of our industry. We also need to consider how we can be more inclusive. If we're not, we won't be harnessing the best talent out there and we won't have a workforce that reflects the diverse communities we serve. How can we cater for and deliver an inclusive strategy unless we are engaged with our communities and understand their needs and how better to do that than by ensuring we have a diverse workforce? Our businesses will be far more productive and profitable with well-trained and focused individuals. So we need to ensure training, education and personal development is part of our day-to-day -day business. The challenge ahead really does need a step change in attitudes. Do we need to take a leaf out of the British motor car industry? They look at training and education as their collective responsibility to ensure they have a well-beating industry. Also, it's not just about engineers. It's all about, also about attracting the right individuals to want to become, become involved in the support functions that help our industry function smoothly and operate efficiently. So how do you get involved? Firstly, this shouldn't be seen as a chore. It's a great way of giving something back and feeling good about yourself. You can work individually or with your business to engage local schools, colleges, universities and communities to explain what a career in the RACHP industry can look like. There's a host of tools on the IOR website to make any engagement a success. You could also consider, consider signing up as a STEM ambassador and join the great work that Jacinta and others are doing. Again, there's some great advice on that IOR website. I have to admit, I haven't hosted a STEM activity yet and I'm dreading getting mauled by some primary school student. But my colleagues that have done one have all said that it's a liberating and rewarding thing to do. These things are daunting to do, but oh so rewarding. They're also great things to do for your own personal development. They can help develop confidence, presentation skills, and give you a real sense of achievement and reward. Or how about enrolling some apprentices onto the RACHP Trailblazer Scheme? It's an employer-led scheme that will give any successful apprentice an ideal platform for becoming a rounded engineer and to, de to develop their career going forward. Or you could continue to support World Refrigeration Day, which, is, which has done an incredible job of promoting our industry in a positive light across the globe. I'm really optimistic about what tomorrow will bring, but we need to take responsibility for ensuring that in our industry and our people are best placed to rise to the challenges ahead so we can grab the opportunities and fulfil our potential. We can all make a difference, but just imagine what we could do if we work together. Thank you.
So thank you to John for um, putting that message together, together. Obviously a very heartfelt message from him based on his experience. And I hope that is one of the things that will help to inspire you as you think about what you might be able to do. Actually, before I hand over to Jacinta, I just wanted to uh, say that we had some great news last uh, yesterday that uh, Linda McVitie, one of the Institute Fellows and really active in our IRR Scotland um, uh, group, had been nominated as one of the top 50 women in engineering. So uh, that was a, a really great achievement on behalf of Linda. And we very much congratulate her. And I think we can add her to Mike's presentation in future in terms of inspiring uh, women who are actively involved, not only in promoting science careers, but also promoting the uh, refrigeration industry. So just a little, little extra information hot off the press for you. I'll hand straight over to Jacinta. She's been doing a lot of work on STEM, both in terms of volunteering herself, but also encouraging more people to get involved. So handing over straight to you, Jacinta. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Miriam. Um, so <laughs> if you can move on to one of my slides, that'd be great. There you go, Jacinta, is it up for you? Can you see it? No, it just disappeared. <laughs> uh, we actually got it on the screen here, so I'm not quite sure what's happening with you. Jacinta. Okay, well, anyway, no, I've got a paper copy. Does it? Okay. <laughs> I hopefully people get the message anyway. So uh, thank you. I'm probably going to re repeat a little bit about what uh, both John and uh, Mike have said. But again, it just shows how important the message that we have got to say really is. Um, so people might be asking, like, you know, why, you know, should we promote? Uh, careers in refrigeration, air conditioning and heat pumps. And it's been highlighted that, you know, we've got a shortage of various skills within the industry and not just engineering, particularly engineering, because it is gives you the greatest, you know, background and foundation into all the other areas that uh, the sector has to offer, such as, you know, uh, marketing, admin, you know, any, any, any other uh, skill that the sector needs. So it's really about promoting everything, not just uh, necessarily engineering, but today we're going to focus on that. Um, so we need to, uh, we have, it's, it's a continuous um, journey that we go on to try and uh, encourage and inspire the next generation. So that's one of the reasons that we need to uh, kind of get on board, I guess. Uh, refrigeration, air conditioning, heat bombs is a sector that's I find hidden and overlooked a lot uh, because it's not something you see or take much notice of. Uh, the general public don't tend to do that. Um, so we kind of have to make the industry a little bit more attractive, try and find a way to make it a bit more attractive when you're comparing, for example, I always use the, uh, the comparison of aviation. You know, you go to any careers fairs or anything, any big skills competitions, you know, they've got great big aircrafts there to automatically grab your attention. So we're in competition with other sectors and I think it's important that, you know, we try and uh, get on, get on board and support where we can. I mean, employers and colleges already do strive to deliver excellence uh, in the sector and there's constant, you know, improvements and schemes and apprenticeships that people try and, uh, you know, get, get, get behind. Um, so results show that 73% of 11 to 14 year olds don't know what engineers do. 69% uh, of parents are unaware of what engineers do and 42% of teachers are not confident enough in giving advice on engineering. Now, those figures came from uh, a UK report, an engine, engineering UK report, State of Engineering 2018. And I uh, myself am on a different, on a course at the moment with STEMazing and that's how I came to know those figures. And it kind of staggered me really like that the young, the younger, more impressionable ages uh, are losing out on what actually could be turn out to be a great career for them and as John Skelton said you know most of us fell into the industry and that's not what we really can rely on we need to kind of push towards more um, strategic approach on how we get uh, more diverse uh, people into the industry so another reason why uh, obviously RACHP is present in every sector in some form or other and I think that was really highlighted uh, the last year, particularly, you know, how critical our sector is, you know, producing um, critical services to the food, food supply chain, pharmaceutical industry, data centers, you know, without data center, we wouldn't be able to have this, 
you know, uh, function today of a video conference or webinar and hospitals and so on. So it's, it's, it's there, as I say, it's just overlooked. And I think that's one of the reasons why we kind of really need to push uh, the profile um, so much of the, of the sector because it is a great sector to work in. So uh, you're probably gonna ask now in your head, uh, why or how do we do this? So uh, it's been mentioned recently, uh, the last couple of speakers, STEM. So STEM is obviously science, technology, engineering, maths. So STEM learning are uh, a group or you know, company that uh, share similar objectives to the Iowa war when it comes to raising the profile of those subjects. Uh, the wonderful thing about RACHP is that, you know, every subject of STEM is in the one subject, which is RACHP. So whether you're interested in science, technology, engineering, and maths, you refrigeration, you will find something in refrigeration that would suit you. So, and more. Um, so I think learning, uh, STEM learning rather, uh, also have the facility to become a STEM ambassador. And that means that, you know, uh, people like me, uh, other people on this uh, panel today are STEM ambassadors who volunteer our time, uh, our companies allow us time uh, to go and engage with schools, children of younger ages, five or six, right up to you know colleges uh, on how great the industry is. And I suppose um, it gives us the platform because we already have the platform. It's a, it's a national, uh, why a nationwide should I say a platform that they've got and it's something that we can you know bolt onto the back of and engage with it more on a, on a local level so wherever you live in the country you will have a local hub a STEM ambassador hub that can you know engage you with your local schools your local colleges your your local activities that are going on so it's really um Activities such as workshops, speed networking events, career fairs, virtual sessions, face-to-face. Uh, -face. I've got something coming up uh, not in a few weeks' time where I'm getting to go back into a school. I haven't done that in a, quite a while. So I've delivered sessions uh, over the internet like this, and it's, it's great, but it's just not the same. You, you don't get that feedback. Sometimes the class is on mute or something, and you can see, you can see them doing and listening, but it's, you just don't get that immediate fee, uh, energy and feedback. So I think that's how I see uh, us as an industry. It's not the only way, but it, it's, it's, a, it's an existing platform that is working and uh, something that you know, so many of us have already got a great reward from uh, getting involved. So that it would be the how. As a result of doing all this, um, as I said, it raised the profile of the industry among those who can influence the future generations, such as teachers, parents, mentors, organizations, uh, all of the adult, I would say, world <laughs> can, um, we, 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 we can influence, we can take it as a responsibility to, uh, to give back, as John said, and to feel great reward for, um, encouraging and inspiring others, especially particularly when they're at an impressionable age. Um, by doing this, we also uh, get to support local community, industry and economy. So, for example, if, you, if you're working for a company at the moment and you're interested in getting involved, there is great opportunity for you to engage with your local STEM hub, local schools. And one of the big bonuses, I guess, about being a STEM ambassador is that it's recognized. Schools automatically recognize STEM and STEM learning and STEM ambassadors. And particularly because as you go through the process of becoming a STEM ambassador, you go through um, a background check. So you've got the, you automatically are endorsed to work with uh, children. Um, and once you get through that process, you might see my badge, but you get a little badge to say that you're a STEM ambassador. So it's just, Again, it's something else that makes you feel like you've achieved something. 92% of STEM ambassadors say that their sense of achievement or award is increased. Um, and like John said, your confidence, your 
presentation skills, your personal development is, as well as raising the profile of the industry is, uh, I, uh, I, I wouldn't not do it. Uh, I wish I could do more. Um, it is a full-time job in itself, I guess, if you, depends on how much you sign up to different activities from their uh, website. Um, and I found teachers in general are just so grateful for, you know, you turning up first off, they're delighted that you turn up. They're delighted that they've got something else to talk about an industry that's, that they've not heard of. Uh, and in particular, there's uh, one particular school I did a session with and local to them was a really large food factory. So refrigeration air conditioning was a massive thing for, for, th for that school because you know, many of their friends or family may already work there and not even realize, you know, what kind of equipment or what kind of services are in there and that they might be able to get involved in, not necessarily have to do what their friends or family do uh, working on the production line or something like that. So it's, it's kind of looking at your area, what's local to your area um, and Kind of making a strategic approach as to how uh, you can get involved and get the best result for you as you get out what you put in is what i would say um so then the resources uh there's quite a there's quite a lot on the iowa iowa website there's even more on the stem learning website uh, there's a link there um but if you just search for stem learning or stem ambassador you're automatically brought to their page there's guidance notes on the uh, IOO website on how to engage more. I could be here for an hour myself just telling you how to do it, but the, the, the guidance notes are there to guide you. And of course, fantasticfridges.com is something that the IOO have put together and put great time and resource into. And there's so many videos, um, you know, resources there that you can use to, depending on what the task or activity is, that you can borrow information from and uh, you know make your sessions your own and it's about getting into it and the more you get into it the more you enjoy it and then the easier it becomes because the first one or two times does get a little bit uh, daunting but at the same time it's so worth it I think and for me I don't have children myself I don't um, <laughs> I, 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 I just don't know how to engage with them they're not our, my friends are you know I, it's it's something alien to me, I guess. And at the same time, going through this has kind of brought it to me. Um, and I, and I, I, I got something back from it. So I imagine if you've got children of your own, you would appreciate it even more. So uh, I think that's it. If anybody's any questions, I'm more than happy to answer uh, or guide or get in touch with me directly or through Miriam or whatever it is. But uh, that's why I think uh, you know, STEM learning ambassadorship is the way forward for the industry. Not the only way, as I say, but one of them. Thank you. Thanks, Jacinta. And sorry, the, uh, you lost your slides there. I know it's hard to, <laughs> to talk to, to thin air, but uh, we could see them and it was all good. So that was fine. So you've given a really great overview of something tangible that people can do. So yeah. we all we always hear people talking about skill shortages. Um, but, you know, what we're saying is, is, you know, there is something it's not something for someone else to do. It's something that you everyone can do. Mm. And we have a team there, uh, Jacinta and others who can help you. And, uh, and we are trying to set up some networks. So anyone interested in either going through the STEM process or if you're already on STEM, drop us a line and we'll have, we have meetings every, uh, we're gonna be setting them up every three or four months so that you can share ideas and, um, and see how it goes. So thanks again, Jacinta. Pop no, questions no in there for her if you want to into the, into the chat box and she can reply directly and, and give you some more advice. So we're moving now on to the next part of our program. So this time we're bringing in some of those, those uh, young people who are inspiring um, or have been inspired to join our industry and hopefully will then inspire the next uh, uh, set of, uh, of young people. So we're doing something called a three minute thesis, which sounds a bit scary. Um, what it is really is taking um, some top uh, students who've been nominated for their research, their groundbreaking research, and inviting them to present to everybody today, just for uh, three minutes each. So it's very, very tight uh, time frame here to give us a little summary of the work that they've probably been doing for about 10 years. So we are giving them a real challenge to try to make this um, 
innovation work really uh, makes sense to people here. So we also have a number of judges joining us. We have three researchers from different universities in the UK, and then we have four judges. And I'm delighted to say that our four judges, uh, you can see their pictures there, or you might be able to track them down in, in the Zoom pictures. Um, and uh, they are all past winners of the Institute's Ted Perry Award. The Ted Perry Award was set up by one of our past presidents some years ago, um, to encourage our students to consider our refrigeration related research. It's been going for, for quite a few years and his family actually provides some support uh, to uh, provide technical material to the winner. And then we have a sponsor, uh, Hawko, who will provide some prize funds to encourage the students to participate. So we're going to invite them each to speak for a very, very strict three minutes. Um, at the end of which we will then take our judges into a separate room and they will consider what they have heard. They will also have already seen the full um, summary of the thesis and some citations from the student tutors, etc., the nominees, and they'll be considering who should uh, win the prize this year. So the first year we've done this judging live. Um, and then at the end of our meeting today, they will be bringing back the, the winning uh, researcher to uh, announce the winner and let them know that they have won and say a few words. So I think that's all the background that I need to say. Um, and we'll come on to our first um, oh, and I also want to say, if you had any questions for our researchers, you can pop them in the chat box as well. Um, we're going to come to our first uh, researcher who will speak. It's Nasheen Basha. So hopefully, Nasheen, if you just want to unmute yourself and say hello, that I know you're ready to go. Hi. <laughs> hi, hi there. Thanks. So here's uh, Nasheen's slide. She is going to talk to you for a full three minutes. I have a timer here and I will have to interrupt you if you overrun. So I will leave you to go forward. Nasheen is from City University of London and she's going to tell us about her work. If you'd like to start now. Hello everyone. Uh, what if I tell you that, you know, you could have efficient compressors with minimal design changes. So that's where my research is. So, the compressed air systems in the UK emit around 470 kilotons of CO2 annually, which is, which is a huge problem. Therefore, in order to reduce some emissions, what we need is energy efficient compressors. So here my research, I focus on twin screw compressors as these compressors are used in refrigeration and air conditioning systems. So 80, nearly 83% of twin screw compressors are oil injected machines and oil in these machines is important for cooling, sealing and lubrication. However, if we have excess amount of oil that can add to increased losses and therefore inefficient machine. So therefore what we need is optimal oil quantity. Though these machines have been in operation since 1950s, but there has been limited publications in the area of optimal oil injection within these machines, and as well as the distribution of oil in the compression chamber. And that's mostly limited because experimentally, there is no way of getting, it's a very hard way of getting an optical access to visualize oil distribution inside the compression chamber. Therefore, in my research, I use computational fluid dynamics to understand the distribution of oil as well as temperature within the compression chamber. Here in this case, uh, I'm showing you a test case uh, of oil and temperature distribution for a typical industrial uh, compressor where one of the conventional injection is through single oil injection ports. And that's shown on the left-hand side of this slide. So when you see that the single oil injection ports Port that's placed on the female rotor side, the red color region shows the oil distribution. So there is high amount of oil on the female rotor side and low amount of oil on the male rotor side. So this sparse distribution of oil in the bottom figure in the temperature, you can see the red regions where there are high temperature spots. Therefore, if you pick the same amount of oil on the right hand side of the figure and we distribute that evenly, then the oil is well distributed and that reduces the temperature spots in the compression chamber. So the difference between the conventional and the improved design is a reduction of 35, 35 to 40 degrees of compression chamber temperatures. And this reduces the power consumption by 2.3 percentage. And the more importantly, the specific power is reduced by 1.8%. Uh, so therefore, uh, in a summary, this sort of a 
research being applied to a wide range of compressors, then we could see the improvement in compressor efficiency. And then we add up over the compression operation cycles, then you see the savings in emissions. Therefore, this uh, propels us towards our goal of environmentally friendly compressors, which are useful for a far greener, healthier planet, much like the divine uh, tree in my slide. Thank you. Thank you and well done. You are pretty much within your three minutes, maybe a, a millisecond over. So thanks for that, Nasheen. So um, there was a lot to take on board there. So I can ask our four judges if they'd like to unmute briefly. We've got time for one or two questions. If you'd like to uh, ask, uh, give Nasheen the opportunity to say a few more words about anything she's suggested. If you want to unmute yourself, the judges, you're all on mute at the moment. Okay, I'm unmuted. Yeah. Oh, Rob, sorry, Rob, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, um, we've, you've obviously got a, um, a profile there that you, you've looked at and you've shown in, in your slide here and in the, the reports that you, you submitted. How adaptable is the work that you've done for different rotor diameters, rotor lengths? Um, because obviously that varies from different sizes of screw compressor. Yeah, that's a good question. As far as we understand how the oil is being distributed, if you could have a way uh, through computational fluid dynamics, we could understand how the oil is being uh, distributed, then we could always improve where the location and position of oil injection code to be. It simply said, you know, like pour your oil where your heat is so that you see an improvement in adiabatic efficiency. And when you look, looked at this work, was it for one diameter? I mean, there's, there was one diameter mentioned within your uh, report. Have you looked at different diameters and, and lengths? Yes, yeah, we have looked at a bigger compressor as well. But the lobe combination, which is four five, it remains same. Also, I would like to mention somehow in the bottom of the slide, I had a reference to the paper that was published in Applied Thermal Engineering Journal. But there is a Zoom tab that it's not showing the reference, but, but yeah, so I can put that on chat for more information on this research. Thank you. So do we have any more questions from anyone else on what you've read or seen or heard today? Um, there's a question from the audience. Have, we com have you compared the cost of manufacturing changes to the cost of energy saving? Uh, uh, since this is a very minimal design change of adding another oil injection port, so we thought that the, the cost would not be very substantial. but obviously uh, this work uh, another of my colleague is continuing with this work so that would be the plan for future okay brilliant so thank you very much i think we are about there on that one i will reset my counter and we'll thank you very much for, for that summary um and then we're going to move on to our next person and there's another question in the box actually Nosheen, if you want to answer it uh, privately yeah, so yeah, coming now that. okay thank you um we'll let you go uh so our next uh person is james bull uh james i can see you there and you are unmuted so that's excellent so james is from the university of portsmouth and we'll talk about a novel compressor design development sizing and optimization so we've got your slide up and you're good to go james i'll start you now awesome so the air conditioning paradox is one of the most difficult challenges within air conditioning and refrigeration industries. As climate change drives the temperature of the globe higher, the energy requirements for cooling systems increase, specifically ones that are linked to external environments. So <clears throat> as we can't aren't currently able to uh, run fully renewable power grids, more fossil fuels are being used to meet the energy demand of these air conditioning systems, which then contributes further to the temperature increase of the globe, which then links back to the paradox itself. So ensuring cooling systems work as efficiently as possible is more imperative than ever. The compressor is arguably one of the most vital parts that affects the performance of a cooling system, it's the part that consumes the power. So this thesis explores the optimization process of a novel centrifugal compressor design and further investigates the methods with which are used to design centrifugal impeller blades. Uh, there are currently a variety of different design methods that exist, uh, some based on geometry variation, others based on formula, and others based on design database. Uh, this research revolves around a design database method um, that uses centrifugal compressor blade design simulated using a high performance computer and then inputted into a design database for analysis. The database contains all the geometrical parameters that um, make up the shape of the blade, the fluid flow parameters that would be simulated for the blade 
blade and the simulated outputs. The analysis of the database using an optimization program um, produced two optimal impeller blade designs that can be used in a two-stage compression system for a required pressure ratio and uh, cooling capacity. However, it's important to note that that was with one specific working fluid. So if you did want to change the working fluid, it doesn't necessarily mean that these two designs would be optimal for a different working fluid. Um, and further analysis of the database using multivariate statistics, specifically multiple regression analysis, offers an understanding into which parameters have the greatest impact on the performance of the blade. So as you can see on the slide, there's a power regression modeling graph that shows the difference between the power equation power prediction equation and the simulated power of the CFD simulation, which shows a reasonably good fit. For anybody that's a stats nerd, the R squared value of that fit is 89.35%. Uh, so prediction equations like these not only highlight the key geometrical parameters that have the greatest impact on the performance of an impeller blade, but they also provide insight into how adjusting these parameters could then achieve a desired result. So this has significant relevance when considering the design method of an impeller blade for the future, it's because you can utilize these prediction equations to almost shape a blade into the way you want it to look so that it will achieve a, so for this example, a lower power required to achieve the same uh, pressure, uh, lower power required to achieve, this, achieve the same efficiency. Thank you, James. I'm going to have to interrupt there. I'm sorry and stop you. So I've, hopefully you've got your main points across in your, in your three minutes. Um, and again, anybody, any more questions, you can ask him directly into our question box as we move on to our, our, our four panelists, our judges, to um, maybe tease out a little bit more information from what James has been telling us. It's all, it's all about compressors today, it seems. So uh, Jolian, you're unmuted. Was there something you wanted to say? Yes, I did. Um, thank you for a very interesting presentation. With your database prediction tool, I'm assuming that the only way it works is by filling that database with all of the various analysis parameters. And you mentioned that you needed to potentially do that for each different type of working fluid and so forth. I was wondering if you could just comment, therefore, on how long it might take to optimise for a new working fluid or how long the process would take you, therefore, to take your design requirements through to an optimal design. Well, actually, part of the next stage in the research would be incorporating working fluids into the database. So then it, it, properties of a fluid could be considered an input characteristic. So you could then change the fluid and in theory, it could then change the predicted result. However, uh, the database would need to be scaled massively to incorporate all the different kinds of fluids and uh, operating conditions. Um, I would say for creating a new database for a different fluid, it would be a lot quicker than this initial database was created because the uh, method for populating the database was almost optimized itself when doing it the first time. So if I had to do it again, it could be a month, two months. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question. Anybody else? Um... Rob, did you have anything? I, I did. Um, you mentioned um, James in, in in your in your great presentation and, and your, uh, your your submission as well that the the work you've done is designed around the um, the design chilling capacity, um, but more often than not, uh, and pretty much all of the time, the chillers often work well. Sorry, operate below design efficiency and below design conditions. Um, what work have you done at looking at that and 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 how that uh, affects the the design that you you were um, the designs that you've been looking at here. Um, well, at the moment, the design that has been created hasn't been compared to an actual experimental data. So although it's been optimized and in theory, theoretically speaking, this is the most optimal design, obviously, it hasn't been compared to a real life version of that. There are limitations with what's considered in the database that would exactly affect the results that have been said. So say if the efficiency came up as 80%, it would probably not be 80% in the real world, it might be somewhere near 75, but it would still be more efficient than something that was 75 according to the database. So although the numbers specifically may not be correct, the trends that they show in theory should still apply. Okay, okay thank you. I'm going to move us on. So we've had an equal amount of time on presentation. So thanks, James, and thanks for answering the questions. And our third our young researcher who's going to speak with us today is Mubarak Ishmael from the London South Bank University talking about investigating the performance of new alternative heat pump and using shape me memory alloys. Uh, so Marabaric, you appear to be um, unmuted and I'm going to leave it to you, carry on. Thank you. 
uh, refrigeration today stands as the spinal column for many sectors, uh, which include, but not limited to, uh, commercial and residential buildings, uh, transport, uh, manufacturing and preserving food and medicine, and even in aerospace. But unfortunately, it lacks the, the recognition and appreciation it deserves. And when often refrigeration is mentioned, it gets uh, picked on because of the perceived emissions, as well as the low speed of advancement uh, compared to the sector's service. As for almost one century, uh, our sector has been solely dependent on vapor compression system and refrigerants as working fluids. And even most of today's discussions are about finding refrigerants with uh, low global warming potential and about the path towards net zero. This, however, cannot be achieved without having a closer look at alternative heating and cooling technologies, uh, and in, in particular, heat pumps. Uh, this is where the idea of my, my project has seen the light. My project evaluates alternative technologies, and we have published a paper on that, and it focuses on shape memory alloys, which are natural smart alloys that are used in many uh, fields, including saving people's lives. Those alloys, when stressed, uh, they reject latent heat, and that can be used in heating, and by reversing the cycle, they absorb heat, and that can be translated into producing cooling. And since the idea is revolving around cycles, we did cycling experiments, which have shown that the material can uh, withstand up to 70 million cycles. And that means a shared memory alloy heat pump can have a lifespan of more than 30 years. My project builds on the knowledge and analysis extracted from experimental data. And through a simulation, it works on enhancing thermal outputs from, from the material in order to incorporate it in, in the heat pump. This dish technology is called the elastic caloric technology. It is non-flammable, non-toxic, and scalable. It's a brilliant, promising technology, but not only is it going to tremendously participate in expanding heat pumps uh, market, which is already significantly growing in places like India and China, but most importantly, it's going to present refrigeration as an innovative, environmentally friendly, chemicals-free technology. And by doing that, we will be changing the image of refrigeration and we will be doing our bit in healing the world and making it a better place. Thank you. Mary, to Sorry, thank you very much. We are, you're absolutely on time there, so that's great. So uh, let's move then on to questions. Uh, any questions from the audience or questions? Ah, Joe, you seem ready to go on this one again. Um, you mentioned that when it rejects heat, the um, heat rejection was latent, um, but you didn't mention whether when it absorbs it's sensible or latent or a combination of the two. I was just wondering if you could uh, comment on that side of it for me, please. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's an interesting question. Basically, the material works, basically the grains of the materials, when they're shred, they change and it's a face-to-face -face, uh, change material. So when the materials are put under stress, they reject latent heat, and when the, the stress is removed, they absorb latent heat, and then the temperature of the material becomes very cold. And hence, if you pass a fluid on the material, the fluid picks the, 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 the basically the temperature from, from the material, and then you can use it for cooling. Okay, any other questions? We've got time for, I think we've got time for one more, uh, possibly two more. Um, Rob, did you have a question? Yeah, and, and so you mentioned, um... Mubarak, very, really uh, interesting sort of insight. You mentioned scalability um, in terms of, of, of uh, energy um, output for heating. What sort of um, scale are we talking about in terms of, you know, in the future, what, what could this look like in terms of uh, capacity numbers? Thank you very much. That's a very interesting question as well. Uh, now at the moment we're working, uh, like I said, we're working on ex exper experiments, so basically laboratory experiments and simulation. So at the moment we're talking about uh, the, the, the technology can be scaled from a few watts to uh, one megawatt, because as, as long as you have the material and you have enough uh, hydraulic power, then you can compress the material until it gets, because the material basically changes phase and it needs a specific uh, stress for the material to be able to reject the laser heat. So if you can provide 
a hydraulic pump which can get you to that point, then you can scale to you can scale basically the technology up to one megawatt. Okay, and we've got one question in the box here. Um, how easy are the alloys to get hold of? Are they expensive? Uh, no. So basically, the, the alloys they are natural occurring, and they can be found in different places. They can be uh, a source from Europe, and they can be a source from the Far East, and they are not expensive. So even now, we, when we started the project, we were targeting uh, uh, we were targeting 250 euros per kilowatt. So basically, even cheaper than the heat pumps in the market now. And then very quickly, have you applied this concept to a built cooling system yet? Uh, it is still on research uh, stage. We we're researching, we're working, with, we have a working prototype, but, but it's still the, the, the working prototype can provide heating and cooling equally. So yes, it can be used for, cool, for cooling and for heating, but not it, it, it hasn't yet been commercialized. Okay, not in place yet. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much for those questions. So that's about, uh, about it for our um, three minute thesis format. Um, there, so everyone's had three minutes to chat and three minutes of questions. So we will invite our judges to um, consider against the scoring criteria and they're gonna go into a little Zoom room and have a chat about that and review also more details about that they have. I would assure you that they have actually looked at the full <laughs> um, summary theses and documentation. So it won't be judged purely on the, on the very short presentations. But thank you very much indeed to the three nominees for going through this grueling process of a, trying to summarize your entire life's work in just three minutes. So, um, and uh, also thank you for our judges um, for taking time out from, as you can see, people who've won the award in the past are now in really important leadership, important roles in various different organizations within the, our industry. So we'll let them carry on with that work. And in the meantime, um, we are going to move on to our next session. So uh, Lisa's going to bring uh, back on board are um, some apprentices and trainees. Now, um, the people joining us today uh, have are, are all were nominated as the um, part of the finalists in the IOR and um, RAC Magazine Student of the Year Awards. So we've got three of the finalists joining us. We're just finding them in our, in our list of attendees and we'll be spotlighting them. And, uh, and they're also going to be joined by Mike Creamer, and we'll sort of bounce some ideas around and have a bit of a chat. So I think we are just looking now for um, uh, who's a, uh, Luke, Luke Hale, hopefully is going to be joining us as well if he's on board. Um, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. And uh, so if we, if, we, if we track down Luke, he'll draw, oh, there he is. <laughs> <laughs> right, great. So you're all, all with us now. So let's uh, let's let you introduce yourselves a bit, um, and then we will come back and comment and talk a little bit about our industry and why we are we perhaps have an issue around apprenticeships and what can be done to encourage more and support apprenticeships more widely. So Ellie, you're on the top of my screen. Would you like to start by saying uh, where you are working, uh, where you're studying, and a little bit about what brought you to the refrigeration industry? Yeah, so I'm Anna Claire from Work Refrigeration as the Operations Manager. Um, I started with Work three years ago as admin trainee, but then I developed into project management and I've done a few technical courses as well. I think I joined the career um, by accident, really. I didn't really know what the industry was about being 17 at the time. Um, but once you get into the industry, it's always something new to learn and the processes and technology is always something new to learn, which is really interesting, really. OK, thank you, Ellie. And then moving then on to Gemma, do you want to say a few words again? Same thing, uh, where you're from. And I, I, I've heard this before because you're on the call yesterday, but I'm, it's always interesting. So please go ahead. <laughs> I'm Gemma. I'm um, from Janie Hall. I'm studying at Eastleigh College on level two at the moment. Um, training to be a refrigeration air conditioning engineer. Um, I yeah, I fell into the industry um, back in 2018, and have yeah, and I um, I'm also part of the group the WRICHP, which is you know is doing me the world of good and getting getting onto these calls and stuff. Um, so that's the uh, the women in RACHP network group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Thank you. And Luke, can you say a few words as well? Hi, I'm Luke. I work with Lightfoot Defence. We do more like a niche market refrigeration with the military. I got into the industry through a work experience week at school. 
Um, most of the options at school were quite boring, simple things that I didn't really fancy. So I managed to get in contact with the director of Lightfoot and get myself a week's work experience in which at the end of it, I was offered an apprenticeship upon completion of my GCSEs. Thank you. And Mike, while you're on the line, do you, do, do you want to say, how did you fall into refrigeration industry? Uh, well, interesting. I was a mechanical engineer to start with and um, in the automotive industry. And I started um, designing chemical dehumidifiers, which need refrigeration to after cool the hot air that they produce. And uh, so in specifying those refrigeration systems, I became interested in it and then moved into um, the air conditioning world uh, completely and then refrigeration. So it's mm -hmm. been a great, um, a great journey. So and it's then, it's interesting that for everybody that it's it's not necessarily their first um, choice of career. <laughs> I guess there was no career careers advice to you in schools about that. I mean, if you if you um, uh, you guys you, you the, the the award winners if you know if you had uh, the the head of careers for UK or, or globally um, in, in front of you, what would you say to them about you know why uh, you know why are we struggling to get awareness of refrigeration careers? What do you think? Just, I'll start with that one then. Um, I find that it's almost unheard of in schools at the moment because I've left school about two and a bit years ago now. And it's refrigeration is very well, unheard of, as I said. Uh, and it's the same with apprenticeships as well, is that there's quite a, almost a negative stigma associated with them because, as, as I just mentioned earlier, it was for people who didn't do well in school, for people who just can't do the theoretical things. Refrigeration is a fantastic combination of science, mechanical engineering, and all the calculations behind it. And as we've seen, it's constantly evolving from the three minute speakers earlier. There's always improvements to be made to this industry. Yeah, and, and what about the the others then? I mean, what do, what happens when you say to somebody, one of your friends, you know, I work as a in refrigeration, you know, how and they go, what? Mm -hmm. You know, what do you say to them? Do you want to start, Ellie? How do you how do you respond to that? Um, I do, like Luke said, it's not mentioned in schools. It's not mentioned in colleges really. I did start in aviation because that's what they drill into your head uh, when you're at school. Um, but they always ask how you, you come across it and. To be honest, it just falls into something when you, you just come across it, really. And once you're in it, I don't think people ever leave it. Mm, mm. Um, you just develop more and more. And there's a lot of room for developing. Like 30% of our business is aging. And we're trying to employ younger people on a traineeship just to for them to train us up for one day where they will retire and we won't have as many staff in the business. And, and what about you, Gemma, then? How did you swap out of a very non-technical uh, career, I think? Um, how, you know, how, how did they persuade you into doing something that was, you know, technical, something which was a technician job? So when I, left, when I was at school, so again, it was unheard of. I said before, you know, girls did hairdressing, boys did mechanics. There was no opportunity for you know, for us women to go and get our hands dirty and, and you know, do kind of what we want to do. Um, and I went through uh, much of my early 20s, not really knowing what I was going to do, where I was going to be. And an opportunity came to be a trainee as an engineer. And I just thought to myself, I'll just give it a go. I don't know what I'm stepping into, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll try it. I'll try anything. And yeah, like I've not looked back. I uh, love every second of it and I think it's really important if you've got a good placement and good you know like a good company behind you for support I think that's the main thing that keeps me going. Yeah so. I mean what let's talk a little bit about the apprenticeship then because I know I think you're um you're all on, on uh no Luke and Gemma are on the apprenticeship and Ellie you're on a traineeship you said yeah yes. so we'll talk a little bit about the apprenticeship first so so was that attractive as a as a training proposition to you was that something that made you think actually this this might be a serious career um how did you feel about that Luke because I know you've stormed through your apprenticeship haven't you yeah I uh, got into apprenticeships because both my parents undertook a, a similar scheme when they were younger and they've uh, did quite well in their careers from starting at the bottom and then working their way up etc 
and I love the fact that we're earning money as well as learning on the job because I've had the a great opportunity now to save and compared to the rest of my sort of friends that are my age I've managed to get a good amount of savings behind me because I've been working and they've got another few years of what, a-, a levels etc university before they can start earning some good money behind them. So your parents were already quite supportive of the apprenticeship route is that right? Yeah, they're they're very, very supportive in uh, that decision. Yeah, and I I think this is one of the things the apprenticeship suffers from, that people think it's a secondary choice for those who aren't academic. But actually, um, from the conversations I've had with you guys and others, the the academic content is is quite challenging, Uh, certainly in the refrigeration one. You've got the calculations and the maths and and, and physics and things. And and Gemma, apprenticeship, how's it going with your apprenticeship at the moment? Yeah, really good. It's obviously been hard with the current pandemic um that set us back quite a lot so we're back in college now which is great but it's a lot of catching up to do and you know trying to get back into the you know the scheme of things and how life was pre-covid so yeah that's quite that's quite challenging but it's all exam uh, as Luke would know we're doing all of our exams at the moment so um (laughs) yeah that takes up a lot of time and, and what about, I think when I have talked to you guys before, you mentioned the, the fact that having a group of students that working together was also important. So that's something maybe we'll come on to, on to Ellie in a minute because you're, you're working on your own, I guess, a bit more. But yeah. for, for Gemma and Luke, you've got a group of, um, a cohort of students that you're working with. So how does, how does that work? Do you support each other and, and get that experience through working together? Yeah, I, I find it really, really helpful especially in my class, we all help each other. We'll all, even in our free time, we'll call each other up. um, And and we kind of, I think we have the approach, especially obviously in my class of we're all one, we're all together, we'll all get through it together. And nobody falls behind because nobody lets anybody, because, you know, if they're struggling revising something or if they're struggling in a certain area, like people will, will jump on board and help that person you know get through that and I, I find that really really helpful and I've yeah. had quite a good good luck with my exams recently and and I think that's due to the support I've had. Yeah because I think that's really I mean that's a skill right that's a, a skill of a, of a fridge engineer or an air conditioning engineer that they need to be able to work as part of a team uh, yep. supporting other trades supporting people from different organizations so I think that's really you make you realize that that the three-year or two-year apprenticeship whichever one you're doing is is something that that builds in more skills than just the technical and practical skills yeah I'd agree exactly 100% with that as well because I've made some fantastic friends at college and we all have our own different skill sets and I work mainly with a guy called Roscoe and he has some fantastic knowledge behind him the practical skills and with me being fresh out of school I was quite good at the calculations etc another guy called Dougie who was fantastic at brazing so between all of us we all sort of bounced off each other's skills to help each other out and whilst we are competitive, we're not against each other at college. And I think, Luke, you had also said that you'd had a lot of support from your employer. Yeah, my employer is fantastic. They always, always will give me time if I need time for college to help, etc. And they've got some guys there with some fantastic knowledge that I'll go and speak to, ask questions. They can go through for hours and hours explaining everything that I need to know for my college, all the tips and tricks, etc. Yeah, so that's the that's the real tenant of the apprenticeship is the partnership between the the college and the, and the teaching and the practical work with the employer. So maybe Ellie, you can tell us a bit more about the the non apprenticeship route. So it's it's uh, it's a different way for employers who perhaps don't feel uh, able to take an apprentice on. You know, that's not the only way to get new people in. Um, tell us a little bit about about the kind of training you're getting involved in with Wave. Um, so we do it all internal, really, but do send them on courses as well. Um, so we learn off the most experience in the business already and do the courses. So I've done Prince 2 project management, FGAS, leadership and management level five, and now I'm going to do the level five now. Um, I think it's I think it's really good being able to learn with people in the business, going to start learning hands-on rather than studying. I know a lot of people have different ways of studying. People like to read, people like to go out and do it and learn from that way. And it just gives you the flexibility of which way you want to learn as well. Um, all the guys who work here give all the time and effort. They'll let you go wherever they want with you. And I think as I'm doing the operations, I'm now able to do the operations and be able to go and sign. It gives you that flex- flexibility. 
where all our trainees will learn each aspect of the business now and they they will choose their own pathway really which gives you confidence in they'll do well as they want to do it and they enjoy it doing it as well mm. so you're working with other trainees as well you're not the only one there uh, no so we, me and sam we joined three years ago and we're now fully qualified we've got two younger trainees as well who are going through the training now as well so they're looking to you are they some, for some experience and uh, uh, yeah they look at everyone really um which is really good it's really nice to see how many employees are there there uh, we've got 17 but far a base in india yeah so it's interesting that there's you know even for a reasonably small or a government classified small organization there's still yeah. a commitment to training and 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 they they share what we're hearing from the others about that working together and supporting each other yeah it's really good it's really yeah. nice to see yeah, do you have any thoughts, Mike, about what, what everyone's saying about how they're working? Yes, I was wondering uh, what sort of mix of um, theoretical work that they uh, and training and education they get in relation to practical work. So, uh, what with the apprenticeship? Going out on site. So, there's one example of getting some practical, I think. Uh, but what about that? Yeah, so how, how much of your time is spent out on site and how much in the college if you're doing the apprenticeship? Um, Luke and I, we're both on different courses. Um, we actually met at college the other week um, to catch up because he's doing the block and I'm doing the day release. So I do one day in college and four days on site, um, which I, I find really helps me because I can reflect on what I learned at college on the Monday with my colleagues. Um, I've got some fantastic support in Jamie Hall at the moment with, you know, the people that, that have actually attended Eastley as well. So yeah, it's good to, to have some understanding there and some help. Um, but I'm not sure how Luke gets on if he if he on your block. I, I go for, I think at the moment, I do one week a month at college. So three weeks at work and then one week at uh, college. I find that to be great for my learning style because I find if I keep going at it and it sticks a bit better for me in the week. Um, but it's again down to personal preference. It's some people it works far better to have their week. Some people it works better to have a day and then uh, speak with your colleagues. See what we get from that. Yeah, so it's a great uh, it's a great um, explanation for everybody of just how flexible that apprenticeship can be. You know, it depends on the employer and the college offering, but the employer needs as well. So um, you know, there are all sorts of options whether you're going for the trainee, the block release, or the or the regular training side. Um, so we've had a, a couple of questions in on the, the chat box there. So I think uh, we did talk about this before when I did some chats with you. So uh, hopefully you can remember. Ambition, where do you see yourself in 10 years time? Um, Ellie, do you want to start? Wow. Well, um, First not, thing. I'm really First not thing. sure. Because it, it changes all the time. You never know. It would be nice as doing a management course to be able to manage a team, maybe look after an account for a, a client. But again, as it changes, your ambition changes as well. Well, that's a really great answer to say, you know, the industry is moving so fast. It's hard, hard to say, hard to tell. So that, yeah. that gives us an, an idea of, of what's going on. Um, Gemma, 10 years time. I want to be... hair will have grown back by then. Yeah. So that's <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, hopefully I have some hair. <laughs> but um, uh, I want to be, you know, quite well in the industry. Um, have a lot of experience behind me and pass it on to the younger generation who are coming up um, and encouraging younger people into the industry. So I want to be a role model, um, stay obviously on the tools, carry on doing the engineering, um, just because I'm, I'm a very hands-on person. Um, but yeah, that's where I would love to be in 10 years time. Thank you, and Luke. I find I agree with Ellie and Gemma is that the because the industry is evolving constantly, my ambitions has changed quite a few times in the two years of where I want to be uh, going down towards the commissioning engineer route or down to management, etc. I think that will change a number of times between now and when I make the decision. But I also would like to do what Gemma aspires to do, which is teaching the younger generation going into I think um, STEM, etc. I would love to, to take part in something like that soon. Yeah, we'll get you in touch with Jacinta and she'll sign you up before you know it for the STEM ambassador. So that'll be great. <laughs> that'll fit. You can add that to your portfolio if you're your apprenticeship as well. That'd be good. And another quick fire question. Um, 
what do you think that employers should be doing to attract more people in the industry? Everyone's always saying there's a skill shortage, there's a lack of young people, the new people aren't as good as the old people coming through, all that sort of thing. What should the employers be doing if you had the magic wand? Let's go the other way around. Let's start Gemma. I think uh, the way the way uh, the world's going at the moment is technology. I think uh, social media is, you know, it's taken over. Everybody's on social media um, and getting the word out about the industry because the industry is still not well known. Um, and I think, you know, employers, people, like everybody can kind of do it together, even if it's, you know, a few posts here and there. And, you know, word travels fast. So I think that's, a, that's the way forward. Yeah, that reminds me of what uh, John said earlier about imagine what we could do if we all work together on it, because yeah. those individuals are doing great things just in their own in their yeah. own sphere. So great. Thank you, uh, Luke. So I believe uh, building on what I said earlier, I think STEM companies should sponsor and take part in STEM activities going into schools. And as, again, what I said earlier is it, refrigeration isn't very well known. It's going into schools, demonstrating something whether you can show them a cooling effect. And it is quite exciting to see that because I've been playing recently with Peltier plates which are the little thermoelectric refrigeration uh, components and they are really interesting to mess around with play with and see that cooling effect so that's what we need to do is to grasp their interest with STEM. Great thank you and Cl uh, Ellie sorry any ideas that you've got for the uh, employers what they should be doing? I agree with Gemma with the social media side my job was off advertised on Facebook um, I don't think younger people do go online anymore and look for jobs. They do go to social media. Um, when advertising a job, I don't think you should. It might be against company's policies, but maybe not put a job description on there. Keep the role fluid. Uh, put them into all aspects of the business and just let them choose their own pathway. And I think the confidence will grow in them, in them and they'll just choose the right pathway for them. You'll see the work, the pull out of it. I think there's lots of ideas for those who are listening who might like to get more involved in encouraging their employees into STEM and doing them a lot more on the social media side to not just talk about their product, but talk about the opportunities as a career. And I think role models is great as well. Now, you, you three are already role models because you've been, you know, that's why the IOR and other organizations support these awards because otherwise it becomes like, you know, I think there's 700 employees, um, apprentices or something. Um, and it's just a number. But when you actually see people, you see the dedication of individuals like yourselves and, and how much, um, you know, how much you have to offer our industry. I think it makes a really big difference. So thanks for all of that. Um, uh, there was one other quick fire question for you about the future of our industry. Where do you see our industry going? What's the big issues? How, what's happening? You know, you guys are going to be running the show in 10 years time. So tell us what's what's coming up. Um, Luke, do you want to start? I think our industry, especially at the moment, is quite a safe industry job-wise because refrigeration will be needed for many, many, many years to come, if not forever, because we need to refrigerate things. And especially now at the moment with COVID is we need to refrigerate these vaccines. So in the medical industry, it's essential. Food industry is essential. And with the hottest summers, colder winters, that is also essential as well to keep us sort of comfortable and warm. Mm. Excellent. Thank you very much, Gemma. I, I agree with what Luke said there, but I also think the industry is going to struggle um, because there's not enough people coming into it. There's not there's there's a big gap with the um, qualified engineers and obviously the people who have a lot of knowledge to the people coming up now. So I feel like when when the people do start to retire, there is going to be a struggle. So I think it's important that that um, everyone kind of pulls together to get more people into into the industry and get the industry better known. That. Yeah, that's what I would say. Thank you. And Ellie, then? Yeah, I agree with Gemma. It's very aging industry. Um, you go to site, you don't see a lot of young people on site. They've been there for years. And I don't think they enjoy it. So I don't think they'll want to leave, but eventually they will do. And I think that's when people start to struggle. But the industry needs people in it because it's not an industry which is going to come to a stop, really. It's just going to keep going and progressing further and further. Yeah, so growing industry and, and there's something we need to do something about that. I mean, yeah. Mike, I'm going to throw you then on the spot. You know, what do you think from what you've heard <laughs> our, our, our award winners, our, our, our ambassadors for the future of the industry? And any thoughts you have on what you've heard there? I think um, it would be great if um, any of you three uh, lovely people end up being STEM ambassadors, because I think if you were in schools 
um, there'd be a, a great connection between you at your uh, young age and uh, the young children in school. Um, maybe more so than someone like myself going in because I'm such an old guy. Um, and if you guys can't find any more people coming to the industry, I, I have to keep working and I'd like to I'd like to stop one day. So um, yeah, it's been a great industry. I would say that you've you've chosen a great uh, career, and uh, I just love all the calculations in it and all the things you can solve, which is even simple fundamentals and and the like. So it's uh, you know a, a great uh, achievement on your part to to get the apprenticeship and the uh, training at, at your company. So I'm really pleased for you. All right. Well, congratulations to all of you on being finalists on our last year's competition. And as uh, Andrew Gavis just mentioned there, the next competition is open. So if, if uh, any employers on, on the call or any of you guys who've got uh, people that you're working with, do encourage them to take part. And we'll just keep doing this work to promote um, the careers, promote the achievements of young people. And we'll definitely put you in touch with Jacinda on that STEM ambassador thing and make sure you get signed up for that. That'd be so, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy studying and days of training and, uh, and working to, to take part in this event. And I hope you do uh, do some more inspirational work. And I know that we will hear from you in the future, uh, as, as I said, with our judges on the previous um, segment um you know we we monitor people we keep in touch with them so once they get involved in the institute we try to keep in, involved and monitor your progress so anything you need in the future you know where we are and come back to us okay so thank thanks you. very much thank thanks you. for joining thank you. right and we're going to move on now lisa to the next segment so um moving forward um so i i, I hope you all were i mean i was certainly inspired by their enthusiasm and the ideas that they've got so that's that's great and i'm a bit long in the tooth as well in the industry so really good to see that our next segment is looking at a slightly different careers initiative which is called world skills so that's based on skill fridge so a very much a practical competition a practical visual demonstration of what the great career opportunities and the work involved in our industry um, and we've got two people representing Skillfridge and World Skills joining us now. So I'm going to hand straight over to uh, Mark Forsyth and he'll tell us more. Good afternoon. Thank you, Miriam. It's a pleasure to be part of World Refrigeration Day from the IOR and be amongst those young stars we've just seen who really are truly inspiring. Um, World Skills UK have a team of training managers across all skills, not just refrigeration, air conditioning, heat pumps. But the RACHP products feature within the built environment as an engineered product, and that's where I sit as World Skills UK training manager. My role is to identify age eligible apprentices from UK national skill competition process. They come from employers, they go through colleges, and the aim is that they're invited to participate in World Skills UK training programs. So, with the support of their employers, the apprentices are now known as World Skills UK Squad and undergo an initial training programme involving not more than 25 bespoke training days delivered over approximately 12 months. So along the first year timeline of that training, all apprentices undergo specifically designed milestone tests. So you can imagine, in order to achieve excellence, each milestone test increases the complexity of the skills and knowledge required to achieve the benchmark standards according to an industry agreed technical description for our skill. So the gradual increase in complexity of those tasks is mirrored by a reduction in time to complete the task. And therefore each milestone event provides an opportunity to observe the apprentice's ability to manage not just their work process, but also how they react in a time pressured environment. And this is something that employers do value. So ultimately, our aim is to identify one apprentice who will represent the UK on the international skill competition stage. And although only one can represent the UK, all of the apprentices that have made the journey, uh, they all say that they've gained valuable skills and behaviours that have helped them in their personal and work life. Will Skills UK training programs offer an apprentice the environment to develop advanced practical skills, as well as the unique opportunity to develop their emotional intelligence. So I'm proud now to show you the results of Will Skills UK training programs in the next video clip.
At World Skills UK, we are raising standards in apprenticeships and technical education so more young people get the best start in work and life. We're tackling vocational snobbery head on as we proudly promote the benefits of technical careers. And we're not alone, we're proud to be part of World Skills, a global movement of over 80 countries, which organises the Binal Skills Olympics and through which we celebrate British young people achieving world-class standards against the best of the rest of the world. We are an independent charity working in partnership with employers, education and governments to inspire excellence. Our careers advice shows young people that apprenticeships and technical education can be a prestigious career route on the path to reaching their potential, whatever their background. Develop excellence. We test and assess young people's skills and knowledge against their peers through our national and international competitions programs, improving their confidence and potential. Innovate and mainstream excellence. We drive up the standard of training across the UK through international benchmarking to help thousands of young people and their employers succeed. We stand for excellence at work because investing in higher quality technical education means our economy and country will flourish. Yeah, it's fantastic looking back at those videos. Um, and just to remind you all, the work of WorldSkills UK supports career development through three key activities, one of which is Spotlighting, which is our online careers advice programme. These events are broadcast directly into schools, colleges, and inform young people about career opportunities in apprenticeships and technical education. And there's been over 100,000 registrations last year. The next Spotlight event will take place in autumn this year, 2021. We have an alumni, and this shares the inspirational stories of past competitors in the RACHP competitions uh, to encourage more young people to consider a career in our industry. And of course, there's being part of World Skills, and this allows the use of extensive experience in helping train young people to achieve world class standards through competition based training. And this supports further quality improvement across the skill systems in colleges and independent training providers. And this is through centres of excellence, which are run in partnership with the awarding body, the NCFE. So let's uh, explain to you what's on this slide. We've got two images and what you've heard is what Will Skills do, but in competition-based training, um, let's, let's focus on the resulting apprentice who is representing the UK. Going into that final stage as part of a Will Skills UK team, they embark on a final stage of training. This involves another bespoke programme that's solely focused on installing, servicing and maintaining RACHP systems. So throughout the training, we focus on the core areas of work organisation, communication skills, service repair, installation, commissioning and fault finding activities. So the World Skills Technical Description that we have identifies the apprentice must demonstrate their skills and behaviours over a maximum of 22 hours of competition. So that's approximately over three days. And we refer to this overall activity as a test project, and the two pictures show one element of those test projects. There's three main modules. The diagrams show two of these modules. And if you looked at the left-hand side diagram, you'll see this is um, a test rig from the Brazil international competition where there's heat recovery and a sub-zero temperature module, an ice rink in other words. So firstly, a fabrication test involves the complex flame brazing activity over two hours. That's to build one of these heat exchangers you can see on screen. Secondly, the sub-zero refrigeration system with heat recovery and heat rejection has to be built and commissioned over 16 hours again using a low GWP refrigerant. And finally, the apprentice is provided with an additional AC system using a different low 
GWP refrigerant, and in no more than four hours has to carry out electrical fault finding and mechanical component replacement that involves, again, refrigerant recovery. So all the skills are required to compete. So the training manager's role involves developing such things as these test projects, as per the diagrams, including electrical diagrams, task instructions, assessment schemes that require the apprentice to deliver the work according to legislation, industry standards, and best practice. But we go beyond best practice and aim for demonstrating excellence. So there have been examples of such excellence from past RAC competitors like Stuart Miller, Chris Bailey and Orlando Rawlings. But it's my great pleasure to introduce the National Competition Medal winner and World Skills International Medal winner for 2013, Stephen Burge, who will now explain what competition-based training has helped him. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Stephen Burge, like Mike just said. Um, I work for a little three-man company alongside, well, I'm a director of, alongside my um, dad, um, down in Portsmouth called Cosh Refrigeration. Um, as a little three-man company, obviously we're, we're miles behind all the big boys that can put loads of people into college and everything like that. But in 2013, I went to Germany and competed for the UK. Um, and through all of the college, through the regionals, through the nationals, through the world skills competitions, um, I learned pretty much everything I needed to know um, to get me to where I am today. And since leaving all of the training and everything behind me, um, I've only looked one way and that's to progress and develop and just push forward with everything that I'm doing now. Um, the company's growing. Um, we've actually got an apprentice at college with Luke um, doing the block release, um, who he did actually name drop, which I'm quite proud proud to say um but yeah i mean we're looking forward and that's like everybody else has already said in this in this um webinar it, you can only look forward and we have to progress and if you don't progress you become a dinosaur in this industry you've got to always move forward and everything that going through competition based training through i had a week um specific training with Mitsubishi um, to train myself on anything that I needed to know when I was in competition, um, everything like that, as well as, like Mark said, 22 days of training with himself, one-to-one um, -one training to get me ready for absolutely anything that I could come across in, in Lightwood. Um, the, the stage itself, um, what we're when obviously COVID's not around. Um, we've been every other year um, up at the NEC doing skill shows and uh, skill fridge to try and find new competitors for world skills that are obviously age eligible um, and trying to advertise the, the industry as a whole um, whilst doing that, um, showcasing everything that we can do as an industry um, and trying to get the likes of school, school children and trying to inspire them into coming into this industry um, while they're walking around and can see what we're doing. Um, obviously when they're at school and when kids are at, um, even down to primary, secondary, college, they don't know. Um, and that is the problem, that is the issue. Um, and obviously we need to broaden the horizons and say, right, we're an industry that you can get into and this is what we do. And that's what World Skills and uh, Skillfridge through Mark actually provides to the, pu the normal public to be able to see what we do. Um, the, the actual training has allowed me to become a better engineer um, just generally through the training that I've received. Um, but even down to the timekeeping, the being able to work to such scrutiny of a world skills environment, um, 
being able to work in a team. All right, I was working on my own, on my own pitch, but when you leave your pitch, you go back to a team that's doing exactly the same and it teaches you all of the little things that can progress you as a person to be able to become such a better person and engineer as well. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the tolerances that we're working to when we're on site don't relate to what we do at World Skills, but the, it should be. Everything that we learnt, what I've learned at World Skills, um, I put into my working practices. But when you're on site, you don't see it from everybody. You know, it's it's just how it is. But if we can progress that through colleges, um, pushing the excellency through colleges from younger people to become better engineers further down the line, to and just to just gradually and eventually progress the industry into becoming such a better industry you know and so much more viable for younger people to get into with the um opening it up to the public thanks steve that's really given us a great example of somebody who's moved through the you know the early days of their apprenticeship their mbqs and and on to really showing you know the commitment to higher standards and to bringing on the next generation so appreciate that was there anything else you needed to say mark mark or is that the yeah, there's just one final slide um that explains if you want to get involved in world skills um and support the next generation, Jack Newton, who's representing World Skills UK at Shanghai in 2022. Um, then get in touch at worldskillsuk.org. It's employers and the industry who we need. Mm. Uh, we'll help you. We hope you can help us. Thanks yeah, and enjoy sure World Refrigeration Day. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Mark and Steve. Yeah, and I, I know there's lots of opportunities for companies to sponsor and to help support and provide training and stuff. So do again through the chat or directly get involved with Mark or, or Steve to talk about how if you want to help uh, on, on that side of the promotion side. So thanks again. Um, so now we are coming to the part of our uh, event where we're going to actually identify a couple of people that we'd like to thank particularly and to show them as people who've uh, achieved some outstanding success. We're moving right to the, uh, if you like, the other end of the spectrum, having talked a lot to students and young people. And we want to talk about a Lifetime Achievement Award. So every year, the Institute of Refrigeration Service Engineer Section, now known as the RACHP Engineering Technician Section, gives an award to uh, somebody who's worked as a service or uh, maintenance or commissioning engineer um, for a significant period of their life and made a major contribution through that work. So I'm going to invite um, Mike Creamer to say a few words about uh, this year's winner. Thank you, Miriam. Well, there were four worthy nominations for the IOR RACHP Engineering Technician Lifetime Achievement Award this year. Uh, between them, over 130 years of experience in our industry, including individuals who have shown exceptional loyalty to their employers, who have tried office jobs but returned to the field due to their love of working on systems, and those committed to exceptionally high standards and pride in their work. Now to our winner. Commitment, discipline and passion are the three things that all of our judges mentioned when they interviewed this year's IOR, RACHP, Engineering Tech, Section Lifetime Achievement Award winner. Whether he's working on a technical challenge, training the technicians that work for him or working with customers, he has already inspired his three sons to join the industry and follow in his footsteps. He began his, 40 year, his career 40 years ago in the Royal Navy, seeing service in the Falklands, moving through LEC training and other businesses to settle at Kinnock and Sons. He was nominated for the award by his son who says, he has a natural ability to teach that is displayed by the quality and quantity of the engineers who have learned from him, something he prides himself on. He remains enthusiastic about the future of our industry. This is a fantastic industry, he says. It is not going to go away. It offers variety, you meet lots of people, but you have to know what you're doing and do your job properly. I'm pleased to announce that the winner of this year's Lifetime Achievement Award is Kevin Gregory of Kinlocks and Son Limited. Kevin, would you like to say a few words about what has inspired you to dedicate your entire career to the RACHP industry? 
I absolutely would, uh, Mike, and thank you very, very much for this award. Um, I really cannot tell you how proud I am just to have been nominated, but to actually win the award is just fantastic. Um, I first came into the industry by accident, as you said, in 1983, when serving in the Royal Navy uh, at the tender age of 20, uh, but it didn't take me long to realise that I would develop a passion for it. Uh, for 38 years, I found myself working at all levels uh, as an engineer's mate, an engineer, wholesale supplies, contracts management, um, even as a director. And if I have one message for the youngsters today uh, that are looking to get into the industry, it would be this. Where else can you find an industry that combines engineering, diagnostics, electrical works, pipe work, controls works, working under your own initiative, meeting different people on a daily basis, traveling the length and breadth of the country, walking in to find a client that is in despair because his equipment has failed and it's business critical and walking out as his absolute hero because you've got him out of trouble and he's back up and running. Take it from me, job satisfaction is guaranteed and is beyond compare. After being trained in commercial refrigeration and chillers by the Royal Navy, I went on to train further on the domestic side at Lech Refrigeration in Bognor Regis. And the passion from my trainer, Carl Steiner, definitely rubbed off onto me. Training young engineers has become an additional passion for me. And I cannot remember a time when I have not had responsibility for training in one capacity or another. I have three sons, as, as you mentioned, all of whom work within the industry and were trained by myself. And I am immensely proud of everything that they have achieved as individuals. There is nothing more rewarding than bumping into one of my previous apprentices at a wholesalers and learning that they have advanced within the industry and in many cases are now running their own businesses. To the young people out there that might be looking to a career in refrigeration, air conditioning or service engineering, let me tell you this and please excuse the cliche. The more you put into this industry, the more you will get out of it. And I am living proof. You can start right at the bottom as a training engineer or an engineer's mate and end up the proud winner Look at that, it's gone back to front. The proud winner of a Lifetime Achievement Award with the Institute of Refrigeration. Once again, thank you very, very much. From the bottom of my heart, it is really nice to be recognised in this way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kevin. We've, uh, we, we really enjoyed uh, talking to you when we were doing the interviews and, and you've got so much that you can share. And yet again, uh, I'm working on, you know, the themes from yesterday. It's about role models and a great role model there for people who've had a, a great career and, and been able to give something back. Uh, so thank you, Kevin. And also thank you, ACR Journal, for uh, providing the prizes. Uh, for that award, um, so and the a tankard and the and the certificate, and we'll we I know Kevin's applied to join the institute, so uh, he will be again kept involved, and we'll we'll bring him along in future. So uh, we now have uh, another award to come to, um, and this is the results of our three minute thesis. So those who were on the call earlier, you heard uh, three research students telling the, you uh, about their work, and I've got Rob Lamb, the chairman of the judge, to give us the results. Thanks, Miriam. Um, I just want to start by thanking the three applicants um, for uh, putting forward their applications and uh, presenting today. Uh, all three of them did a great job. Uh, Nasheen, James and Mubarak, really thanking you, uh, three, all three of you. Uh, thanks also to the judges uh, for, their, for their help in putting that together and in, uh, reading through all the various papers and then uh, for the work uh, today in terms of the questions and the, uh, the breakout room as well. So, it's fair to say that there the was a good quality of, of applicants um, and it was really interesting work. They did some good presentations um, and you know, the, the research is, is moving our industry forwards. Uh, we had a tough time, but uh, came across, uh, came to a, a conclusion with a winner. And uh, that was based upon the fact that we felt that this, uh, not only the quality of the application that came forward, but we felt that this was an uh, uh, a piece of research that would have an immediate effect, that could be a global effect um, and was ready 
uh, to apply now. And so I'm delighted uh, to congratulate uh, Nasheen Basha on uh, winning the award. And I'll pass you over to Nasheen and hopefully she can say a few words. I'm quite excited and thrilled. I mean, I, I actually didn't expect this. So I don't have a polished speech, but I have my thoughts, which I want to convey. So in terms of uh, air conditioning and refrigeration, I grew up in Middle East. So I was, I went to a school in Dubai. So where the temperatures are like 40 degrees is just very common. So there were times when I was coming from school, walking 15 minutes or 20 minutes in 40 degree temperature. And I was like, I just wanted to get inside a bedroom where it would be fully air conditioned and cool. But still, when I was growing up, I realized very early on that I wanted to be an engineer, but I didn't aim for becoming a refrigeration engineer or air conditioning engineer. I thought of becoming an aerospace engineer or a marine engineer, to be honest. So uh, it, it's the refrigeration and uh, air conditioning so much around us. I, I thought that it's, I, I took it for granted and I'm quite <laughs> guilty for that, for the fact that it was so important for me. I couldn't stay uh, without uh, air conditioning for, for a couple of hours a day, but still I never thought that how that would work and who are the people who are working behind it. So yeah, so I'm quite guilty about the fact that that, that has happened. But I'm quite glad to be a part of this industry and engineering for me is a quite rewarding, uh, enjoyable, as well as a, a career where you can push your uh, boundaries really. And obviously we saw that with the COVID vaccine and refrigeration where the refrigeration engineers had to quickly come together and then have some refrigeration solutions for the COVID uh, vaccine storage. So I'm quite delighted with the fact and also we are in a times of, that are challenging where we want to get towards uh, net zero, we want to get towards zero emissions, so which requires obviously very uh, creative solutions. So when there are creative solutions as going forward, I would, I would really like to see all sorts of diverse workforce coming in place. But I think that's where the creating, creative solutions will come from. So I think that's all I've got to say. And thanks, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. I, I've, I'm quite delighted, thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Nasheen. Congratulations to you and thanks for our judges for taking the afternoon to do that work. Um, and we'll bring Nasheen back uh, sometime later in the year or next year to give a full detailed technical talk about her work and you'll be able to ask more questions and get into more detail than, than we've been able to have today. So I'm going to hand back now to uh, Mike as we're getting towards the end here for some closing remarks. Um, so Mike, over to you. What do you think of the day? Well, uh, many thanks to all of you for kindly taking the time to join us today for this very important careers-based event. I hope you found it useful and informative and that this will benefit you um, in the future. Um, our industry certainly needs um, as much help as it can get, and I hope today has actually been valuable in that regard. I'd just like to comment on um, what we experienced today, if I may. Uh, we had... Uh, a good presentation from John Skelton, who has put in tremendous effort as our chairman of the education committee, who along with the committee members has been aiming to identify all of the actions we can implement to recruit our next generation of engineers. The primary theme has been the production or promotion, I'm sorry, of our industry within schools, making young people aware of the career opportunities that are waiting there for them. And this work also includes the encouragement of diversity, where we hope that we can awaken an interest in young girls as well as young boys, to consider a career in an industry offering so much varied, interesting and enjoyable work. And there's so much opportunity for new entrants to our sector with long-term and secure employment being fairly certain, given the ever-present need for cooling, refrigeration, and of course, industrial and domestic heat pump heating. So thank you, John, for all that you have done. I'd like to uh, go on to Jacinta. We heard from Jacinta regarding the STEM ambassador uh, program, and uh, she's also a member of the uh, education committee. Jacinda gave us a clear overview of how we're supporting the delivery of STEM efforts within school classrooms. This is perhaps one of the best possible ways in securing our engineering workforce into the future by sowing the seeds of interest through enthusiastic presentations delivered by our STEM ambassadors. Jacinda explained how you can become a STEM ambassador and I sincerely hope that some of you might consider this opportunity. Just imagine delivering a short classroom talk and having only one boy or girl deciding to enter our industry and them then working within it for 10, 20 or even 50 years, uh, like me. Um, they would have a rewarding and enjoyable career, financing their working life and our industry would benefit tremendously from so many years of service. 
Some of these new recruits might go on to become entrepreneurs, starting up air conditioning or refrigeration businesses, employ many others as well, or perhaps inventors and developers of new products and technologies that benefit our environment. So I think it's great that Jacinta and STEM are connected with children as young as five or six. So my thanks go to Jacinta for all of her efforts and to all of the STEM ambassadors out there. Uh, the Ted Perry Research Student Award. We uh, had a three minute thesis session from each of those uh, students, each presenting the results of their hard and valuable work. Two of these were related to compressor performance and efficiency. And given the compressor is the beating heart of millions of our systems, this is a very relevant area and one in which I'm personally interested. The other related to work on elastocaloric refrigeration, which I also found really interesting. My congratulations go to the winner, Nashim, and I also thank James and Mubarak for their valuable contributions and for participating in this renowned Ted Perry Student Research Prize. My thanks go to the judges, David Bostock, Christina Francis, Jolly Ann Thompson, and to Rob Lamb, who announced the winner for us. Uh, apprentices, Miriam and I had then had a conversation with the apprentices, discussing why they had decided to become RACHP technicians. They've previously been involved in apprentice competitions, with Luke winning the ACR Today Training of the Year Award and Gemma achieving the RAC Student of the Year Finalist Award. It was really refreshing to listen to what they had to say, and I was especially keen to learn what had motivated them to work in our industry. Their reasons for choosing our sector are valuable to us, for us to be aware of, particularly when talking to young people in schools via the STEM program. So perhaps our STEM ambassadors can refer to Gemma and Luke's achievements when raising the potential interest of uh, children in schools, and of course, Luke as well. So uh, Eddie, I should say. Mark Forsyth gave us a really interesting overview of world skills. Um, he's wholly dedicated to the cause of elevating the skills and knowledge of young people within the industry. I happen to know that he has held significant posts as a training manager with major manufacturers, as well as being extremely knowledgeable in many aspects of refrigeration. He's an extremely enthusiastic guy when it comes to the World Skills Project and gives up a tremendous amount of his own time and effort toward this great cause. Mark introduced Stephen Birch to us, who kindly explained how competition-based training had been a valuable assistance with the rapid development of apprentices. So thank you both Mark and Stephen. Finally, we had the winner Lifetime Achievement Award, Kevin Gregory, who gave a great um, uh, speech uh, in uh, receiving his award. It was really great to listen to that. Um, he clearly impressed the judges with his commitment and passion, and it was so good to hear that he was also training other technicians in the course of his work. It's just great that Kevin's three sons have also joined our industry. We need as many good engineers as we can get. So uh, congratulations, Kevin, well-deserved. Thanks also to, um, I've covered all the salient uh, aspects, I think, in my brief summary, but um, I should like to thank Lisa Waters at the IORHQ, who's done so much to make today's event possible. She, Claire Tooth and Miriam, our hardworking CEO, have put in a lot of effort and planning for the benefit of us all today. And on behalf of all of us present, uh, I thank you all. And finally from me, best wishes to you all for your continued health, safety and career success, as I now hand you back to our very capable CEO, Miriam Robway. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, and thanks again for coming all the way from uh, a hotel in Manchester to, <laughs> to help us out today and this afternoon. So, um, yeah, there's been a real great variety, a lot of contributions, you know, some themes coming through the, the discussions about working together, about uh, the importance of that STEM initiative, and also about the resilience of our industry, how we are always there and always able to respond when, when the world needs us. So I think that's really uh, a great inspiration for anybody looking for a career that makes a difference. Um, and, and quoting our, our winner, Kevin, you know, the more you put in, the more you get out. So I'd really, from the Institute's point of view, anybody on the call wants to get more involved in these things you know as as mike said we've got the three of us um, from the staff here are on on the call that's 50 percent of our staff at the institute uh, we have only six so we need our members to make these things happen none of this happens without you um, you make our um, all of our guidance notes you you make all of our communications all our webinars happen so if you're looking for an opportunity to develop your career and to make a difference to the future please do get involved come back to us and we will point you in the right direction to get you involved in some of these initiatives or other initiatives if you're interested uh, drop us a chat there or email us afterwards so i'm going to ask lisa to uh um yes to play us out with a little review we've done of some of the initiatives that have been going on 
uh, and um, she'll run that for you if you want to stay or you can pop off and get back to your work. Otherwise, we'll see you on our Zoom call some one time soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone, and goodbye. Thank you.